All right. Hi, Math 9 students. Um, as you know, we're heading towards the final exam in not too long, uh, just down the road from now. So what I'd like to do at this point is I'd like to spend this whiteboard recording going over questions from assignment uh, 34, which went over some questions from previous achievement exams. Um, I thought this would be helpful to you. So uh, please watch this recording. Also, you'll notice that the it may possibly be the case that the whiteboard comes up a little bit uh, smaller than it should be, and so you might have to just kind of uh, grab the lower part of the board and just kind of open it up wider. Uh, so just wanted to mention that as well. Hope things are going awesome for you guys, and uh, we'll just get right into this then. So the first question here is talking about uh, the following expressions are examples of powers. And so it says list them in order of increasing value. So, so in other words, from smallest to largest. And so then we put it as a four-digit number. I just need to get my little uh, pointer out here. Okay, so what we need to do then is we need to change each of these from a power into some sort of other number, other form of number, so that we can compare them. So let's review what each of them is going to look like when we simplify them. The first one we have here is 2 to the minus 2. And so we've got a negative exponent. And just a reminder that when we have a negative exponent, there's two things we have to do to change it to a positive exponent or to simplify it. First thing we do, step A, is to make it into a power with a positive exponent. So since it's 2 to the minus 2, we just make it into 2 to the 2. And then step 2 is we're going to divide 1 by that power. Okay, so we first of all had 2 to the minus 2. We make it into 2 to the 2. And then we do step B. So since we had 2 to the 2, and step B is just divide 1 by that power, we have 1 over 2 to the 2. And then since 2 to the 2 means 2 times 2, the exponent 2 says we multiply 2 by itself 2 times. So it's 1 over 4. And so 1 quarter is the uh, fraction form of the original number that we had. OK, good stuff. So let's look at the next one, which is going to be this one here, minus 2 to the exponent 2. Well, what that basically means, the minus in front says take 2, raise it to the exponent 2, and then make that whole answer negative. That's really what that means. So you could, could also think of it as minus 1 times 2 to the exponent 2. OK, so what is 2 to the exponent 2? That's just 4, right? So it's kind of like minus 1 times 4, which is the same as minus 4. OK, so minus 4 is the value of number 2. Now let's move on to number 3. Number 3 is minus 2 to the exponent 2. Well, again, that just means minus 2 times minus 2, right? The exponent 2 says we're just multiplying the base by itself twice. And when we multiply minus 2 times minus 2, it gives us a positive 4. Because a minus times a minus is a positive. Same with a minus divided by a minus is also a positive. OK, so our answer for 3 is 4. And we just have one more to go. And so this one here, when we look at what it means, it means take 2, raise it to the exponent negative 2. So use those two steps to change a negative exponent into a positive exponent. Once you find the answer for all that, then make it negative at the end. That's basically what it means. OK. Well, that's one way of doing it. Well, let's see how we do it then. So we're going to, uh, first of all, take 2 and raise it to the exponent negative 2. And then we change it into a positive ex exponent. That's step A. So now you can see that we have 2 to the positive exponent 2. And the next thing is to divide 1 by that power. So we divide 1 over minus 2 to the positive 2. Now we're just keeping the minus here. You could get rid of it and just kind of bring it back at the end. Uh, but you can do it this way as well. Okay, but remember, since it's minus 2 to the exponent 2, we're just multiplying minus 2 times minus 2, like you can see here. And then we've got the negative still in front. We haven't done anything with it yet. So we've got 1 over that amount. This times this is going to give us 4. So we get 4. And then we have the negative as well. OK, so we bring that negative in at the end if we like. So instead of having 1 quarter, we have a minus 1 quarter. 
So now we can compare all our four numbers since we've changed them all into a fraction or a whole number. So I just wrote the value of each one of these numbers, these four numbers, in red. So we have one quarter minus four, four, and minus one quarter. So now we need to organize them from smallest to largest. So what's the smallest going to be? Well, that's going to be number two, which is minus four. The next smallest is going to be minus a quarter, which is number four. The next smallest is going to be a quarter. And the next smallest is going to be four. So the order is two, four, one, three. And that's what we write for our answer. OK, awesome. So let's go on to the next one then. Next question says, and again, we're not covering all the questions on uh, MA934, just some of them, but most of them. Uh, so the next question says, what is the value of x in this equation here? So we have to find this missing exponent, x. Well, we can kind of simplify the question because you can see that it's got 2 times 6, and that multiplies to 12. Okay? So those numbers aren't really involved in the answer. We can just get rid of them and just focus on the powers that have a in them as the base. Okay, so we're just focusing on a to the minus 3 times a to the x equals a to the 15. We just ignore the numbers. Okay, so because we're multiplying two powers that have the same base, they both have the base of a, we know that when we multiply powers with the same base, as you can see what I've got written here, we add the exponents. So we add the exponents minus 3 plus x, and that's going to equal 15. So minus 3 plus x equals 15. We can rewrite it. It kind of looks better if it's x minus 3 equals 15. Now, we could solve that as an equation if we like. We could add 3 to both sides of the equation. Or we could just think to ourselves, OK, some number minus 3 equals 15. Well, that's going to be 18, right? So 18 is the right answer, and that's going to be D. All right, moving on to the next one, question six. It says the perimeter of a triangle is 24x minus 6. The lengths of two sides of the triangle are represented by the expressions 5x minus 7 and 2x plus 5. Which of the following expressions represents the length of the third side, so the missing side of the triangle? Okay, well, let's just kind of first of all refresh our minds on what perimeter is because the question talks about perimeter. The perimeter is the outside edge of an object or the distance around it. So if we look at the distance around this fence, that would be the perimeter of the fence. Okay, so now let's look at how it relates to the triangle. Now here's the triangle, and the question says that one of the sides is this long, the other side is represented by this uh, expression. And the third side is some expression. And we need to choose one of the four possible expressions for the multiple choice. We don't know which one it is. But when we read the info in the question, it also tells us what the total perimeter is. So that's going to be the total of these three amounts, because that's the distance around the edge of the object, right? So here's how we can write it. We can write it as one side, 5x minus 5, plus the other side, 2x minus 5, plus some expression that stands for the third side equals 24x minus 6, which we're told is the perimeter. So those three things added together equal this expression, which is for the perimeter. OK, great. Now what we can do is we can simplify, right? Because we always group like terms. So we group x's together. So 5x and 2x, that's going to give us 7x. We group the numbers together, minus 5, minus 5. That's going to give us minus 10. So we've simplified this and got this. So now we've got 7x minus 10 plus some expression equals this amount, which was the perimeter. So now we would need to choose the expression. Again, we've been given four different expressions. And uh, here's how we go about it. Well, we have 24x on the right side of the equation. And since it's an equation, we would have to also have 24x on the left side, right, if it's equal. So if we already have 7x, how many more x do we have to add to that 7x to get up to 24x? Well, that's going to be 17x, right? And another way you could do it is just subtract 24 minus 7. OK, so 17x is going to make the x's equal on both sides. And then on the right side, we have minus 6. 
Well, so far on the left side, we have minus 10. So that's smaller. So we're going to have to add something positive to get it to minus 6 on the, right, on the left side, right? So if it's minus 10, we're going to have to add four positives to get back to minus 6. So with the x values, we're going to add 17x. And with the numbers, we're going to add the number 4. So it's going to be 17x plus 4. That's going to be the missing expression here. Okay, so if we wrote that out, if we wrote out, you know, 17x plus 4, and now if you did the same thing we did earlier, where you group like terms, so you group together x's, you're going to have 17x plus 7, uh, 7x plus 17, that's going to be 24x on the left side, minus 10 plus 4, that's going to give us 6. So now both sides of the equation are equal. And so now we can see which one of the answers we want to choose. And that's going to be answer C, which is 17x plus 4. OK, so that's how we do that one. And now question number 7. This has to do with surveys and uh, what we talk about uh, sometimes when we're talking about correctly phrasing a question or doing the research on a survey. That's talking about bias or lack of bias. So what is that again, bias and lack of bias? OK, well, a bias survey is one where everyone does not have an equal chance of being selected in it. So for instance, if you were doing a survey and you only asked you know, people who were you know, maybe uh, 20 to 25 years old and it was a poll of Canadians, well, that's going to be a biased survey, right? It doesn't represent everybody. So with an unbiased survey, everyone does have an equal chance. So when this question says, uh, Ross conducts a survey to determine the demand for a skateboard park. Ross can best minimize the bias in his survey by surveying people. Okay, so he's going to minimize bias. He wants to make it as least biased as he can. So let's look at each one of the possibilities and see which is the least biased. Okay, well, the first one says one location. So what if he only asks people at one location? Well, what if his location happens to be a skateboard store? You know, asking people right in front of the skateboard store. You know, you can see that asking people from one location is bound to introduce some bias because you usually get just one type of person walking by a certain location, you know, whether it's a skateboard store or maybe it's a, a mall or something like that. Um, although a mall, you're going to tend to get a, a broader group of people. But you can see that if you ask people at only one location, you might be getting things a little bit on the bias side. B says people who have a skateboard. Well, those people are going to be biased, right? Because they're almost all of them are going to say, yeah, we want a skateboard park. But you want to be asking everybody for their views on this question, right? So B is kind of biased. C says people who are different ages. OK, well, so far that sounds not so biased, right? We're asking people of all different ages. That's bound to make the survey less biased. And uh, at the same time of day, well, again, that might be more biased because if you ask it at a certain time of day, you know, kids might be in school, so they wouldn't get to share their opinions, for instance. Um, and so, you know, if it's only at one time of day, that might kind of bias things based on where people are, whether they're working or in school, that sort of thing. But the least biased is people who are different ages. Okay, question number 10. Which of the following calculator keystroke sequences would give the solution to this problem here? All right. So now when you're keying in uh, these kind of calculations or math operations into your calculator, um, you've got to find a way to tell the calculator that you want to divide this numerator by this denominator. So how do you kind of tell the calculator that you want to focus on that numerator? Well, what you do is you put brackets around the numerator and brackets around the denominator. So what you would do, this might be a little hard to draw a bracket, but there we go. There's a bracket around the numerator, bracket around the denominator. So what you would do then, the keystrokes would be bracket and then 33 plus 9 bracket. And then since this is a fraction, it's really the same as a division question, right? So now we would press division on our calculator. And then since we've got another bracket, we put that there. Then we put 6 and then times. And then we put another bracket, 5 minus 2. And then we put a bracket and a, 
a last bracket, and then we press equals. So the main thing you're doing here to solve this is putting brackets around what's on top and what's on bottom to tell the calculator that you want to divide numerator by denominator. Okay, cool. The next question, it says, Kaylee earns $15 an hour, that's not bad, and her monthly expenses are $1,150. And so it says, and I know that's not coming out quite as clear as it could, uh, when you look at the PDF files, some of these things that are, aren't quite as visible on the whiteboard, you'll be able to see them on there. So it says, which of the following inequalities can be used to determine the number of hours T that Kaylee must work in one month to save at least $200? And I'm going to underline at least $200. So what does at least $200 mean? It means $200 or more, right? Okay, great. So now, when we're solving a question that involves inequality, with some types of these questions, it often helps to uh, Pretend it's an equation, first of all, and ignore the inequality side of it, and just kind of bring that in at the end. So if we were going to come up with an equation for this question, uh, let's think about what we would do. Okay, well, we want to think about the overall uh, equation that's going on, the overall math operation, and we would say that the amount that Kaylee saves is equal to her monthly earnings minus her monthly expenses, right? So if she makes a certain amount during the month, she spends a certain amount, and whatever's left over is the amount she saves, right? And that makes sense. Okay, so since that's the case, the question says she's going to save at least $200. Let's just pretend she saves $200 for now. So below amount Kaylee saves, I just wrote $200. Now her monthly earnings, we know that she makes $15 per hour, so the amount she's going to make in a month is going to be $15 times the number of hours. And we could also write that as 15H, right? Okay, how about our monthly expenses? Well, we know that those are going to be $1,150. And we have to subtract that amount from the monthly earnings if we're going to find the amount she saves. So we can see that $200 equals 15H minus $1,150. That's going to be our overall equation. Now, since the answers we're given have $200 on the right side, I'm going to take this equation in this form and just flip it backwards. Same equation, just backwards. Okay, so that's our new equation. All right, now at this point, we're going to bring in the part about her needing to save at least $200. And another way of saying that is an amount that's equal to $200 or greater. So, since this is the amount she's saving here, Again, the amount she earns minus the amount she spends. Since that's the amount she's saving, and we want it to be greater than $200, we're going to put greater than or equal to $200. That's the symbol right there that we're going to use. Again, the large amount of the great, greater than sign points towards the amount of the savings. That savings amount is greater than or equal to $200. Okay, so answer C is going to be correct. Now, we knew right off the bat that it was going to be either, or not right off the bat, but once we came up with this equation, we knew it was going to be C or D because our equation involved minus 1150, which C or D do. Okay? So again, you can sometimes narrow things down on multiple choice questions. Great. So moving on to the next one, uh, we have a question here that has to do with a helicopter. and it says the tail rotor blade of the helicopter shown below rotates four times. The tail rotates four times for every one main rotor blade rotation. Okay? So every time this rotates once, this rotates four times. The question says how many times will the helicopter's main rotor blade rotate if the tail rotor blade rotates 600 million times? Okay, well, first of all, we just write it out. We write out tail rotor rotates four times for every one main rotor rotation. Just kind of helps us to get an overview of what's going on. And then we can, we're going to set up a proportion. And so the way we do that, we say we're going to be comparing tail to main. So we write them as one fraction on this side. 
And then because the question says the tail rotates four times, we write four on the top since it matches up with tail. For every one main rotor rotation, so that's one on the bottom. Okay, so tail to main is four to one so far. Now the question tells us that the tail is going to rotate 600 million times. So again, we're going to put that 600 million on the top because it matches with the tail. And we don't know how much the main rotates. That's what we're going to try to find. And so we're going to just put M to stand for main. So this is actually our uh, proportion. 4 over 1 equals 600 million over M. And now we can solve this proportion to find what M is. So again, we cross multiply when we have a proportion. We multiply 4 times M. That gives us 4M. 1 times 600 million gives us 600 million. So now we've got a pretty simple equation. And since we have 4 times M, we need to divide both sides by M, by, sorry, by 4 to get rid of the 4. And so let's look at how we divide both sides by 4. Okay, we're actually not showing the M, 4M being divided by 4. But 600 million divided by 4 gives us 150 million. So we've got 150 million as our answer. Uh, but the question gives all the answers in scientific notation. So we need to change 150 million into scientific notation. Now remember, here's the steps we use to do that. There's really two steps. First thing we do is we put a decimal in the place in this number that creates a number between 1 and 10. When we put it here, that creates a number between 1 and 10. 1 1.5, that's between 1 and 10. That's the first step. Second step is we count the number of decimals to the right of it. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it's 1.5 times 10 to the blank. And we find out what the blank is by counting the number of digits to the right. And since it was 8, instead of 10 to the blank, that's 10 to the 8. So in scientific notation, that number is 1.5 times 10 to the 8. So that's going to be our answer, and it's going to be answer A. Alrighty. Moving along, we have a question here that has to do with uh, congruent triangles and similar triangles, and we're going to review how that those two relate together. The question says, which figure below, which figure above, I should say, does not prove congruency? Okay, so in other words, which one of these is going to be a situation where we have similar triangles but not congruent triangles? Well, first of all, let's review what similar triangles and congruent triangles are. Now, we looked at this earlier, this idea that if you had a kid and his dad, they look like each other, but the kid is kind of a smaller version of his dad. So that's helping to explain what similar triangles are. They have the same angles as, as each other, but they have different side lengths. That's similar triangles. All three angles are the same, but the side lengths are not. Whereas congruent triangles, it's kind of more like a situation where you have twins, because all three sides and angles are going to be the same with congruent triangles. So here, it's like identical twins. Both the angles and the sides are equal, and that's what makes them congruent triangles. OK, so just looking back then at our original questions, the question says, which one of these will not prove congruent triangles? Well, if we know that all three sides are equal, they've got to be congruent, OK? But if all three angles are equal, they might not be congruent. All three angles can be equal, and one triangle can be a blown up version of the other triangle, right? So this one here, figure two, does not prove congruency. This one does, and this one actually does as well, which is called side angle side. Sides are equal, and one of the angles are equal. And also, this one would be called angle side angle, angle, two angles are equal and one side is equal. Those ones would prove congruency, but all three angles being equal does not prove congruency. 
It just means they could be similar triangles. All right, so moving along. We have a question here, and it says, a student completed the following four steps to solve this equation. However, in one of the steps, the student makes a mistake. And it says, which step is it? OK, let's look at the first step. You've got fractions in the equation. You need to get rid of them. And what you need to do is to multiply the two fractions by a common denominator. <coughs> and uh, so you want to find out which number does both 40 and 60 divide into. Well, 120 would be the smallest number that both 40 and 60 divide into. <coughs> so we want to multiply both the left side of the equation and the right side of the equation by 120. So you can see we're multiplying the left side by 120, and oops, they forgot to multiply the right side by 120. Because remember, that's the most basic part of solving equations. Whatever you do one side of the equation, you do to the other side. And so step one is the one that's uh, where the mistake is made. <coughs> OK. Next question. It says, what is the value of this expression if x equals 8? So what do we have to do here? Well, what we have to do is every time we see an x, we just plug in 8. So here's what it looks like. <coughs> Instead of having 2x squared, we have 2, 8. And then I put it in brackets and made it squared. Instead of having minus 3x, we have minus 3 times 8. Again, we're putting in brackets just to kind of keep things track, keep track of things for now. Plus 2 times x is plus 2 times 8. And then we still have minus 3. So now we're going to have to do the math. So we have 2 times 8 squared, which is like 8 times 8. So that's 2 times 64. We have minus 3 times 8, that gives us minus 24, right? 2 times 8 gives us 16, and we still have minus 3. So we're getting closer to having the answer. 2 times 64, that's 128. Minus 24 is still minus 24. Now we'll just do the math here. Plus 16 minus 3, that gives us 13. We're even closer to our answer. 128 minus 24 gives us 104. Plus 13, we do the math, and we get 117. Not too bad, eh? OK, next question. <clears throat> it says, if the expression here is simplified, which of the following rows identifies the coefficient and the constant? OK, let's review what that means, coefficient and constant. Both those words stand for a number. But what kind of number? Well, OK, sorry. I guess what I did is I first of all grouped like terms and I simplified. And then I, we talked about coefficient and constant. So here's the numbers we had. And we can see we have x's and we have numbers. So first, we group all the x's together. So when we do that, we have minus 3x plus x and 5x. And then we simplify minus 3x plus x. That gives us minus 2x plus the 5x. Minus 2 plus 5, that's going to give us 3x. So that's what we have as far as x. It's 3x. When we put the numbers together, we have 5 minus 8 minus 7. The 5 minus 8 gives us minus 3. Minus 3 minus 7, it's already negative. And the minus 7 makes it more negative. It's minus 10. So 3x minus 10 is our answer after we simplified the math expression. So we have 3x minus 10. And now we have to choose which of these two numbers is the constant and which is the coefficient. Okay? So let's review what a constant and a coefficient are. <coughs> a constant is a number that's on its own. It's not with a variable. So would you agree that minus 10 is the constant? It's on its own? And that means that 3 has to be the coefficient. Because <coughs> the coefficient is a number in front of a variable. x is the variable. <coughs> 3 is the number in front. So 3 is the coefficient. So b is correct, which said 3 is the coefficient, minus 10 is the constant. Awesome. OK, next question. Um, this is going, going to involve algebra tiles. And just a reminder that positive is shaded. This little square stands for a 1. This rectangle stands for an x. And this big square stands for an x squared. So the question we have, we're going to be factoring this trinomial. That's what the question says. This stands for a trinomial. And we're going to factor it 
and our answer is going to be one of these four answers. So first of all, we need to look at this, these tiles here and figure out which trinomial does this stand for. Okay, well, using the info that we know, we know that this <coughs> here is shaded, so it's positive. It stands for x squared. So we know that x squared is the first thing we have, x, and I'm going to put that a little hat like that. A little hat just tells us is x squared. Now we have these minus x's, and there's five of them, so that's going to be minus 5x. Last but not least, each one of these is positive, and there's six of them. They each stand for one, so it's going to be plus six. So x squared minus 5x plus six, that's going to be our trinomial. And so now we need to factor that trinomial, and we're going to get two binomials, and so one of these is going to be our answer. Now, to factor a trinomial, what we do is we start by putting the term that multiplies to give us the first term. The first term in our trinomial is going to be x squared. So what two things multiply to give us x squared? Well, that's going to be x times x. And so we put it at the beginning of each bracket. That's how we're going to start uh, factoring the trinomial. Now, to get to the next term that we're going to put in the brackets, here's what we do. Suspense, dot, dot, dot. Okay, what do we do? Well, what we do, we need to do two things. <clears throat> well, we need to find a pair of numbers that satisfy two things. This pair of numbers are going to add to give us the middle term in the trinomial. And the middle term in the trinomial is minus 5. Okay, so you can see the middle term is minus 5. So they're going to add to give us the middle term, which is minus 5. And the same pair of numbers are going to multiply to give us the last term. You can see the red here corresponds with plus 6. So the last term is plus 6. So the same pair of numbers are going to add to give us plus 6. So again, we're going to find all pairs of numbers that multiply to give us plus 6. And we're going to choose one of those pairs that's going to add to give us minus 6. So let's first of all find all pairs of numbers that multiply to give us 6, which was the last term in the trinomial. That's going to be 6 times 1 minus 6 minus 1 and minus 3 minus 2. Those are the only possibilities. Now, which one of those pairs is going to add to give us the middle term, which is minus 5? We're going to add them up. So 6 and 1 adds up to 7. Minus 6 minus 1 adds up to minus 7. Minus 3 minus 2 adds up to minus 5. Okay, so those two add up to minus 5, which is the middle term. So again, we found a pair of numbers, minus 3 and minus 2, that when we multiply them together, they produce the last term in the trinomial, which was 6. And when we add minus 3 and minus 2, they produce the middle term in the trinomial, which was minus 5. And that's how we factor. And so we're going to put minus 3 and minus 2 into our brackets. And so here's the space we had. We put the minus 3 here, the minus 2 here. So x minus 3, x minus 2. We've done our factoring of our trinomial. And so the answer should be, drum roll please, a. And that should be a minus there and a minus there. They're not really showing up on the whiteboard. OK. So next question. It says, a playground is rectangular in shape with dimensions as shown in the diagram. And it says, by how many meters must both dimensions of the playground be increased in order to double the area of the playground? So when you're talking about dimensions, this one is length, 30 meters, and this one is width. So it says, how much must they be increased? So we're going to add a certain amount to both dimensions. We're going to add the same amount to both dimensions. We want to find how much in order to double the area. Well, how much is the area now when we have 20 by 30? Let's find out how much area we have now, and then we'll know what we have to do to double it. So the current area is 20 meters by 30 meters. So find the current area of the playground. The new area is going to be 2 times the current area to double it. Okay, so to find the current area, it's 30 meters by 20 meters. That's 600 meters squared. 
So we know what the current area is. So what do you think the new area is going to be? Since the new area is 2 times the current area. Okay. Well, we're going to double it, and it's going to be 1,200. So the new area is going to be 1,200 meters squared. Let's see how that helps us to solve this problem. Well, we want to find out how much we're going to add to the dimensions. In other words, to the width and to the height, or sorry, length, to get 1,200 meters. Well, if we currently have 20 and, and 30, one of the possible answers from A, B, C, and D, A, is a 10 meter increase. So if we add 10 to 20, we get 30. If we add 10 to 30, we get 40. How much is 30 times 40? Oh, that gives us 1,200. That's double the original amount. So we already know our answer. Now you can look at the other ones and see what area they give you. So you can see that the area they give you, if you if you uh, have a 20 minute increase of both dimensions, that gives you 40 by 50, and that does not give you a doubled amount of the original 600. But answer A did. Okay, so we can already choose the right answer. It's A. And there we go. Okay. So again, we experimented with each one of these increases and added them to the width and the length on our diagram. And this is just showing that a 10 meter di increase where we add 10 to 20 and add 10 to 30 gives us 30 by 40, which is 1,200. On to the next one. Okay, we're talking about probabilities. Those are kind of cool, really, because you can relate them to real life. And um, so we've got a spinner and a six-sided cube. And the question says, what is the probability of spinning the color red and then rolling either a 1 or a 2. So, we need to find the chance of red, then the chance of 1 or 2. Well, if we're doing both those things, spinning a red and then getting a 1 or 2, if we want to find the chance of getting both of them, then we need to multiply the two probabilities together. We multiply the probability of the two different events spinning and, and uh, rolling the dice, we multiply those two probabilities, and that will give us the probability of doing both things. So whenever you have to find the probability of doing two things, you multiply the probability of the two separate things. So here's what we're doing. The chance of getting red, since there were four different colors, it's one out of four. Well, what's the chance of getting one or two on a dice? Well, the chance of getting one or two, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So would you agree that the chance of getting a one or a two is two possibilities out of six in all? So it's two out of six. So we multiply one quarter times two out of six, and that's going to give us our answer. So you can see we're multiplying one quarter by two over six. We multiply top times top, that's going to give us two. Bottom times bottom, that's going to give us 24. So 2 over 24 is going to be our answer. But that's not one of the possibilities. However, if we simplify 2 over 24 and make it into reduced terms, it's going to be 1 12th. Because we divide 2 into 2 and 2 into 24, and then we're going to get 1 over 12. So B is our answer. All right. Next question. We've got a half pipe, such as uh, skateboarders would use. And uh, the question says, what is the area of the curved surface of the half pipe to the nearest meter? Well, somehow we have to relate this area, which is surface area, right? Somehow we have to relate the surface area to some sort of a surface area of, of one of the shapes we looked at in this course. Well, it's obviously not like a rectangular prism or anything like that. But could you see that this surface looks kind of like the surface of a cylinder? So you could take this half pipe and wrap it around a cylinder. And basically, it's the surface on half of the cylinder, half the way around the cylinder. However, when we looked at uh, the surface area of the cylinder before, 
we talked about the cylinder as having two circles plus a square. And you can see here that we're not going to look at the surface area of this circle or this circle, right? We're only looking at the sur surface area of the square. And we'll see why that's a square. Okay, so let's review finding the surface area of a cylinder. Now the surface area of a cylinder, like we said, um, first of all, let's review that the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. Okay, that's what we use to find the circumference of a circle. Circum and the area of a circle is pi r squared. So once we know those two um, formulas, that would help us if we were finding the surface area of a whole cylinder. Okay, so if we were finding the surface of a whole cylinder, we would find the surface area of a circle, surface area of a circle, and then think about this. Here's the, think of this as like a can, like a tuna can. If we cut this open and then open it wide, what is this shape going to be? Let's say it was the label on the outside of the tuna can. It's going to be a rectangle, isn't it? So we're going to open it up and it's going to be a rectangle. Now this rectangle, so here's like the label that was on the outside of the tuna can. We open it up. We call the height of it h for height. But remember, this length here is the same as the length on the outside of the circle, which we call circumference. And that length, the circumference of a circle, is 2 pi r. So what that really means is one side of this rectangle is 2 pi r, and the other side is h. So to find the area of this rectangle, it's 2 pi r times h. Now that's the area we need to find, and that's going to be uh, equivalent to the area of our half pipe because we, we're not counting the circles. Okay, so 2 pi r h is what we need to do to solve this question. So again, this here is just showing how you find the area of a cylinder, but we don't really need that because we're only focusing on the 2 pi r h part. So to find 2 pi r h, I wrote it out, 2 times pi times r times h. Now remember, the pi is 3.14. If you want, you can um, press it on your calculator and find more digits, but you can just use it to two digits, and that's okay. So 2 times pi, which is 3.14, times r, how much is r? Diameter is 10, r is half as much, so it's 5. So we're multiplying by 5. h, how much is h? It's labeled as 20. So multiply 2 times 3.14, times 5, times 20. Multiply all those numbers together, and you're going to get 628. And that's the surface area of the half pipe. And that's going to be answer D. All right. Now, this next one is going to go over some really important um, uh, sort of exponent laws because we've got different ones involved here. So let's see how we're going to go about solving this one. How we want to solve it is we've got a certain number on top, or a certain expression on top, divided by an expression on the bottom. So we want to first of all solve everything on top, then we want to solve everything on bottom, and then we want to divide what we have on top by what's on bottom. That's probably the best way to go about it. So let's look at the simplification of what's on top. So we've got this here. And so what we want to do in solving this here, again, this is what's on top. We want to simplify what's in brackets, and then after we simplify that, then we can bring this 2 into the simplification. But let's simplify what's in brackets. So in brackets, we have a power times a power, and how are we going to solve that? Well, we know that when we multiply powers having the same base, we add the exponents. So we're going to add 3 plus 4, and that's going to give us 7. So what's in brackets simplifies to 2 to the 7. So now we're going to have 2 to the 7, that's what's in brackets, and that's raised to the power of 2. So you can see that here. That's now what we have on the top. That's what we've simplified so far. Now we have to bring another exponent rule to solve that. So if we have 2 to the 7 raised to the exponent 2, we always multiply the power inside a bracket times the power outside a bracket. 
7 times 2 equals 14. So we get 2 to the 14. I so said when you have a power within a power, we multiply exponents. So 2 to the 4 is what all this on top simplifies to. So now we've simplified the top. Now we want to simplify the bottom. Sorry, guys. Just let that ring for a sec. Let the answering machine take it. Okay, so now we've got this is what we simplified on the top, and now we have the bottom, the denominator, and we want to work on simplifying it now. So this is the bottom, the denominator. 2 to the exponent 2 times 4 to the exponent 3. If we want to multiply two powers and use exponent rules, remember the powers always have to have the same base. But this power has 2 as the base, this one has 4 as the base, that doesn't work. So we're going to have to change 4 and make it into a base that has 2. Well, what is 4 as a base that has uh, 2, uh, a power that has 2 as the base? Well, 4 is the same thing as 2 squared, right? So instead of having 4 raised to the exponent 3, I made it 2 squared raised to the exponent 3. And I put that in brackets. Okay, so we still have 2 to the 2, and it's multiplied by 2 squared to the exponent 3. Now we can simplify this here. We need to do that. Remember, if you have a power inside of brackets and a power outside, we multiply the 2 together. So we multiply 2 times 3. And so that 2 times 3 is going to give us 2 to the 6. Okay, and we had 2 squared before. That hasn't been changed yet. Now we have 2 squared times 2 to the 6. When we multiply 2 powers, we're going to add the exponents. So we're going to add 2 and 6, and we're going to get 2 to the 8. So 2 to the 8 is what we've simplified down to uh, when we started with the uh, denominator. That's what the denominator simplifies down to, 2 to the 8. So now let's look at the numerator simplifies to this, denominator simplifies to this. Now we have 2 to the 14 divided by 2 to the 8. I'm going to rewrite it instead of as a fraction. I'm going to rewrite it like this. What exponent rule do we use? Well, when we divide powers with the same base, we subtract the exponents. 14 minus 8 gives us 6. So 2 to the 6 is the final answer. And that's going to be answer A. All right. So we've got another question that kind of involves probabilities. It says, a student performs an experiment by throwing a paper cup in the air and observing how it lands. A tally chart of the results is shown below. So there's three different things that can happen with the cup. It can land on its side, and they, they recorded the number of times that happens, which is 20 in all. 5, 5, 5, and 5 is 20. It can land on its uh, upright. There were two different times that happened. It can land upside down, and that happened three times. The question says, find the probability of the cup not landing on its side and express it as a percent. Not landing on its side. Well, here's landing on its side. That's this many. So that means that the other ones must be not landing on its side. So you can see that's 2 and 3, which gives us 5, right? Five of the situations are not landing on its side. Well, I wrote out, first of all, to find the probability of it not landing on its side, we write the number of times it doesn't land on its side divided by the total number of times times 100. That equals the probability of it not landing on its side. So we found the number of it times it, not, it doesn't land on its side are 2 plus 3, which gives us 5. Okay. The number of times it doesn't land on its side is 5. So that's what we're going to put here. And then we need to find the total number of times. How many is that? Total number of times, 5, 5, and 5, and 5, 20, plus 2, and 3, 25. 25 times doesn't land on its side. 5 times, or sorry, 25 times in all, total number. 5 times doesn't land on its side divided by 25 times in all. We're going to multiply that decimal by 100. So the, the fraction is 5 over 25 over 100. 5 over 25 this is 0.2 times 100, and that's going to give us 20%.
That's our answer. All right. Next question says, movers from a particular moving company charge $46 per hour. Which of the following graphs represents the relationship between number of hours worked and total cost of the move? Okay. So, let's figure it out. Well, we can imagine how one of these graphs would have been produced using a table of values. What we need to do is, first of all, think of the equation we would have used. Because normally what we do is we use an equation to produce a table of values. And from that table of values, we plot the points to get a graph. So what would the equation have been originally? <coughs> well, the cost, the total cost, equals $46 per hour times the number of hours. That's basically our equation. Cost equals 46 times N. It stands for number of hours. Okay, so that's our equation. Now we can make a table of values. So we just choose hours, and we'll find out what the cost will be for each hour. So here's the hours we choose. For one hour, we multiply 46 times the number of hours, which is 1. 46 times 1 is 46 for the cost. For two, two hours, it's $46 per hour times the number of hours, 2. 46 times 2, 96. Same for 3 and 4. We get these amounts. So now we're going to plot these numbers on our graph. We're going to plot 1 hour and 46 costs, 2 hours, 92 costs, etc. Those are the points that we're going to plot. Remember, whenever we plot a graph, we need to find out what the de dependent variable and the independent variable is. If you write a sentence that says blank depends on blank, figure out what you're going to put in that. You would say cost depends on number of hours, right? You wouldn't say number of hours work depends on the cost. No, cost depends on number of hours. Since cost depends on something, cost is the dependent variable. So the dependent variable is cost. The independent variable is the number of hours. Whenever you find out what the independent or what the dependent variable is, the dependent variable always goes on the vertical axis. That's this one. The independent variable goes on the other one. So hours goes on the horizontal, cost on the vertical. Okay. So we're going to plot these points. And uh, we've got our graph. And we chose hours since there were four hours. And we knew that uh, hours was the independent variable. It goes on the horizontal. We knew the cost was dependent. It goes on the vertical. So we had four hours. So we just made the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. Somehow that didn't come out properly when I did this. It should be 1 here, 2 here, 3, and 4. Anyways, cost, we can see it goes from 0 up to 184, or almost 200, right? So we choose when we choose our graph, we're making it go from 40 to 200. Again, this isn't matching up quite right. I hope it does in the PDF file. Anyways, remember, this should be 40, this should be 80, this should be 120, et cetera. So we plot our points. And you can see when we plot them, we have like 1 hour and 46 cost. So you see here, we had 1 hour. And this is the number 40. So it's a little bigger than that. It's 46. 2 should be um, 92. So we go up here. This is 80. So again, it's a little bigger than 80. That's where we plot the next one. OK, so we plot our points. So you can see what the line looks like on the graph. It's a straight line. So the question says, which graph is correct? <clears throat> we now know what the graph looks like. And we know that it's going to be this one here. OK? And it makes sense that it would be that graph. Because it makes sense the cost over time is always 46 per hour. And that rate is going to be constant, isn't it? You, you, you're being paid at a constant amount. So it makes sense that the line is constant or straight. All right. We're getting, getting pretty close to being done, guys. So next question 44 says, Hank can see the top of the tree in a mirror that is placed 40, 475 centimeters from the tree when he stands 190 meters from the mirror. So here's the diagram we get. And it says, what is the height of the tree shown above? So we need to use the fact that we have two similar triangles. 
Again, this one is a smaller version of this one. How do we know they're similar? When we do two triangles are similar if their three angles are the same. The question tells us angle one is equal to angle two, so one of the three angles is the same. We also know they're a right angle triangle, so the other angle is the same. Well, you might recall that if two of the same, if two of the angles are the same, then the third angle has to be the same as well because 180 is equal to the total of the three angles. So both of them, whatever this is, has got to be the same because when you add up this and this, the third angle has to be the same for both triangles. Okay, so we know these are similar triangles, so we can use proportions to solve for the missing side, which is the height of the tree. How do we do that? Well, how do we set up the proportion? We use the fact that tree length on one side, tree length over 475 equals 172 over 190. Okay? So tree length over 475, this length, we divide it by this length, and so we also have to divide this length by this length. So when we set it up, we make this tree length, we call it T over 475 is equal to 172 over 190. That's how we set up our proportions because everything has to be compared to the, the other side that's the same side. So tree length over 475 equals 172 over 190. We need to solve for tree length. Whenever we have a proportion, we always cross multiply. Tree length times 190, if we call tree length the same as t, t times 190, that's the same as 190t. Okay. And then 190t is going to be equal to 172 times 475. Okay, so again, we've done it here. We got 190t. We do the multiplication on the right side, 475 times 172 is this number. And then we need to continue and solve for t. Since we have 190 times t, we divide both sides by 190. And when we divide 81,700 by 190, we get 430. So that's going to be the height of the tree, and that's going to be answer c. All right, so awesome, guys. We're done. Please practice all these. Um, I want to guarantee you guys you're going to find some of these that I do on these whiteboard recordings near the end of the year. You're going to find them on the final exam. So please practice these and uh, you'll know them well for the final exam. If you have any questions at all about any of these, please give me a shout. And uh, so keep working hard, guys. I really appreciated having you guys as students. Keep it up to the end. Have an awesome day. God bless. Bye for now.